Okay. Thank you. This is now 7 p.m., so we don't want uh, Dr. Wexner to be late. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to share my screen to start your presentation, Stephen. Okay, thank you, Billy. Okay. Uh, bueno, el doctor Stephen Wexner de la Cleveland Clinic nos va a deleitar con una presentación sobre recientes avances en, en la cirugía colorectal. Seguramente todos ustedes conocen al doctor Wexner. El doctor Wexner tiene innumerables títulos eh, de los que, del que más me enorgullezco es que es un amigo de muchos años y ustedes pueden leer ahí su currículum. Eh, es actualmente el jefe de cirugía colorectal de la Cleveland Clinic en Weston. Uh, y además es el jefe de cirugía digestiva de la Cleveland Clinic. Está casado, por desgracia, con una argentina, o por suerte, que es la doctora Mariana Vero, que hoy en día es la chief of staff de la Cleveland Clinic y es la jefa de anatomía patológica. Así que extraña coincidencia si las hay. Esta fue la primera vez que el Dr. Wexner vino a la Argentina. This is a very ancient photograph that I could grab somewhere, I don't know. Eh, este es el Dr. Wexner. Esta es Maureen, que era su asistente quirúrgica. Acá estoy yo, estos son mis padres y esta es mi esposa. Esta fue la primera vez que el Dr. Wexner vino a la Argentina. Estábamos organizando un curso de cirugía laparoscópica. Este es parte del grupo de cirugía colorectal. Este es nuestro actual director del hospital, el doctor Fernando Yudica. Acá lo tenemos al doctor Steven Wexner. Esto es del año 2006. Acá estamos con el doctor Gustavo Leme en nuestra visita en uno de los meetings de la Cleveland Clinic. Y con el doctor Wexner eh, no solo compartimos nuestra amistad, sino también muchas de nuestras actividades académicas. Y aquí pueden ustedes ver la cantidad de meetings a los que ha asistido no solo en nuestro país, sino en el mundo. Aquí tenemos también antiguas fotos. Acá está con el doctor Graciano, el doctor Marcelo Freise, lamentablemente fallecido hace poco, en los meetings del Hospital Italiano. Así que ha sido un asiduo visitante de nuestro país. También es un huésped muy hospitalario y uh, nos ha recibido en su casa. Y quise poner muy a propósito esta foto donde estamos en una reunión uh, en el meeting de la Cleveland Clinic en Florida con su mamá que compartía la mesa con nosotros y uh, en este momento está pasando un delicado estado de salud, así que todos les deseamos que se mejore prontamente. Pero también se sabe divertir el doctor Wexner, y aquí lo ven en uno de sus meetings tocando cosas de los Beatles y bailando con uno de quienes está también asistiendo Uh, a, a, esta, a esta charla que es el doctor Giovanni Milito de, de Roma. Así que gracias Giovanni por haberte unido a, a esta charla. Steven, we don't want to hold you, so you can, uh, uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so you can go on. No, that was a fantastic introduction. I, I tremendously enjoyed it. So did uh, Mariana. So thanks very much for that beautiful introduction and the uh, walk through memory lane with all of those uh, photos. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate my appreciation for the invitation to speak this evening and uh, for all the great memories in Argentina and uh, elsewhere in Latin America and in Miami that uh, certainly that you and I have had for the last 34 years, uh, which has been absolutely wonderful. So again, Mariana and I both wish we were with you in, in Buenos Aires, uh, but the next best thing at this point in time is Zoom. So you had asked me to speak about innovations and advances in colorectal surgery, and there are many, many, many of them. It could go on for days and, and, and weeks about it, but I won't. So I, I tried to kind of theme them into the common goals that we've had during your career, my career in the last three and a half, four decades. Uh, improving outcomes, namely. And how do you do that? Well, short-term decreasing pain, long-term improving cure of disease and quality of life and prolonging life itself, 
And, and lastly, obviously, trying to prevent disease would, would be the holy grail. So if we then divide out some of the major advances that accomplish those goals for um, improving quality of life, prolonging life, and, and the like, minimally invasive surgery certainly tops the list. And then a whole variety of things related to sphincter preservation, weight and watch that, of course, Angelita Habergama and, and, and Rodrigo Perez have been working on, recovery protocols. There's a whole lot of things. And I'll go into a couple of them. I want to start with minimally invasive surgery. I think that really is what, um, what brought me many times to Argentina, working with uh, you and uh, I think it was Alejandro Salsamende and the J&J &J people and teaching a lot of people throughout Argentina laparoscopic colorectal surgery. It's evolved. There's robotic. But there's also other forms of laparoscopic, transanal endoscopic surgery and transanal total, uh, total mesoric excision. So at this point in time, we can safely say that based upon a couple of trials, laparoscopy for colon cancers is certainly at least as good, if not better. Everybody by now, I'm sure, is very familiar with the COLOR2 trial, a very, very large trial, very well balanced with a uh, two to one uh, uh, randomization, um, looking at rectal cancer, which is really the remaining question. Colon cancer is very well accepted, but rectal cancer. Um, and you start to see that whereas colon cancer is at least as good, rectal cancer may be better too. Um, here in the uh, lower rectal cancers, the rate of circumferential resection margin positivity went from 9% in the laparoscopic group to 22% in the open group. And you could say, well, that's a surrogate marker. It's, it's something that uh, Dr. Barrow tells us looking at the specimen, but it's more than that, because in the follow-up paper from Yap Banyer, you can see in those same uh, lower tumors, the local recurrence rate, which was 4.4% in the laparoscopic group, was 117 in the open group. So that correlation held true from the short-term surrogate path marker to the long-term uh, actual disease-free survival. And, and those were their conclusions in the New England Journal. So I think not only is colon cancer uh, approached laparoscopically, so too is rectal cancer. The mistake we made in the US with our uh, ACOZOG Z6051 randomized controlled trial uh, by our cost group, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the randomized control trial one we did was for colon cancer and Heidi Nelson was the first author and Jim Fleshman took over the second trial. Um, the problem we, may, we had was that in the first trial, we planned to get uh, 800 patients enrolled um, at 20 centers within two years. And in fact, we got something uh, far less than that number enrolled in about seven years, uh, and it required about 70 centers. So realizing that problem with accrual, we said, is there a way to expedite accrual? And speaking with the statisticians who worked with us, they said, do a composite endpoint. Just put everything together that we know is important and, and the distal margin, the circumferential or radial margin and the completeness of TME or incompleteness of TME. And that allowed us to decrease the number of patients we needed for the trial and therefore haste and accrual. The problem is this composite endpoint had never been uh, validated. It had never before been used. So we came up with something and immediately used it in a landmark study and we found that there, you know, that laparoscopy was not non-inferior, but was it the technique of surgery or the technique of statistics? And that question was answered in our second publication um, in uh, Annals of Surgery, when it was apparent that it was the, um, the technique of statistics and not the technique of surgery. Because here you can see there's absolutely no differences whatsoever in disease-free survival by kaplan meier estimates or recurrence by Kaplan-Meier estimates. So again, not the technique of surgery, but the technique of statistics. To compound the problem, the uh, Andrew Stevenson and the group from uh, Australia and New Zealand had asked us early on, can we use your composite endpoint so that later on people can do meta-analyses? And we, of course, said, sure. So they did the same thing and repeated the same mistake we had with, with under 500 uh, patients well-matched, again, they could not prove non-inferiority with this composite endpoint. And the same happened to them as happened to us in that there are absolutely no differences whatsoever 
in local regional recurrence or disease-free survival or overall survival, showing that the problem was not the use of laparoscopy, it was the use of a never before used, never validated uh, uh, composite endpoint. And the lesson learned there wasn't to stop doing laparoscopy, it was don't use this composite endpoint ever again. And that's certainly very well known. Um, if, if we look at where we stand currently, or at least more recently in the real world, using the National Cancer Database, which is the world's largest cancer database maintained through the American College of Surgeons, uh, the uh, cancer programs, the National Cancer Database is in partnership with the American Cancer Society and has millions of new entries every year. So within that database, the query was undertaken to look at the minimally invasive low anterior section for rectal adenocarcinoma and found to have in this period almost 36,000 patients, roughly half underwent minimally invasive surgery. And you can see what happens in the real world with minimally invasive technique. As you'd expect, there's is a shorter length of stay, although that's not really significant one way or the other. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, there were, there's decreased risk of mortality with the minimally invasive procedure. And that's what was important. And you can see also circumferential resection margin positivity better for minimally invasive technique, distal margin better, 90 day survival better. I mean, anything as you go down the list is, is better. Overall survival is better. Everything's better for minimally invasive in the real world outside of a randomized control trial. Moving on the theme of transanal endoscopic surgery though, of course, Gerhard Buis came up with this technique back in the early 1980s, long before any of us thought about doing um, laparoscopy and we're all familiar with the technique and it never really caught on for a very long time. So in some places it, it, it was done. Here's uh, one paper with, with, uh, from Ireland with uh, Ronan O'Connell, the current president of the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland and Des Winter. Um, and they looked at six studies, um, almost a thousand lesions and they found that there was no significant difference in morbidity between standard transanal excision and, uh, tr and uh, transanal endoscopic microsurgery or, or what I like to call generically transanal endoscopic surgery because transanal endoscopic microsurgery is proprietary. It relates to a certain set of equipment uh, from the Richard Wolf company and I have no financial uh, arrangements with them whatsoever. But there are other equipments uh, uh, from other companies that have different names. So there's transanal endoscopic operating and, and therefore to make it easier and I use the generic term transanal endoscopic surgery. In any event, no differences at all in, in morbidity between the two groups, but significantly higher rate of negative margins, microscopically negative margins following transanal endoscopic surgery as compared to transanal uh, excision in favor of using this technique. Significantly, and just like we saw in the laparoscopy slides, you have the short-term surrogate of what's found under the microscope and then the long-term result. And just like we found for the rectal cancer studies, those lower rates of CRM positivity in the color two trial led to a lower rate of local occurrence. And here, the lower rate of microscopic margin positivity found after transanal endoscopic surgery correlated with a lower rate of local recurrence following transanal endoscopic surgery. And you can see it's a pretty robust uh, difference in favor of transanal endoscopic surgery. Well, transanal endoscopic surgery really didn't uh, gain any popularity uh, until TATME came up people largely didn't learn it because it was expensive equipment. It was really only usable in a very select subset of patients. So most individuals didn't bother taking up the technique. But now uh, with transanal uh, total mesoric excision, people realize they have to first know transanal endoscopic surgery. The advantages of TATME, and it is certainly, as everyone knows, a very hotly debated topic, uh, better visualization of the distal rectum, being able to clearly see the distal margin and put the purse string suture exactly where you'd like it. <coughs> Many studies showing higher quality of TME without uh, incontinence. That was a fear early on. You're putting in a large diameter scope for a long, prolonged period of time. Didn't happen. 
And what may be a benefit is a lower rate of urinary dysfunction. So th this one study of 140 patients a couple of years ago already showed a very nice rate of complete TME and very acceptably low local recurrence rate. Many more studies have been added to the literature, including the International Registry, with adequate numbers of lymph nodes in every study, very impressive rates of TME completeness in every study, and free margins in most studies, the vast majority of studies. Um, but people have questions about some of the elements of safety too. For example, five urethral injuries and the learning curve is brought up on many occasions. How steep is this learning curve for TATME? The steepest seems to have been in Norway where the uh, Norwegian Radium Hospital found this bizarre and unacceptably high pattern of rapid multifocal local pelvic recurrence in the pelvic cavity and in the sidewalls. So at only a median of 11 month, they found that this rate of recurrence caused them to halt the performance of TATME. Now, in my view, and you know, in, in multiple editorials, including this one that I, I wrote with Sam Atala and Patricia Silla in response, we looked at other series in, in the Western world and, and found uh, serum positivity rates of 4%, distal resection 1%, and most specimens greater as complete or near complete. So we think it has to do with the number of cases per surgeon with the learning curve um, and that um, you should be able to have your best results with TATME. Under that direct visualization, you should have the best possible chance of a complete or near complete TME and a low rate of circumference for a section margin. But only if you're doing a high volume of these cases. You're not going to achieve that goal if you're doing an occasional case, as was, as was done in Norway, where every surgeon did a case every couple of months. It doesn't work well. You can't surmount the learning curve in that fashion. There's plenty of evidence out there showing better local recurrence rates or at least equivalent, better disease-free survival or at least equivalent to laparoscopy. But the learning curve is problematic and people have to be willing to centralize to ensure appropriate volumes by limited numbers of people rather than a few cases here and there by everyone. It's not in the patient's best interest. Where does the robot stand? Well, the robot is, you know, is here to stay, there's no doubt. And I think when initially it was thought robotics would switch people from open surgery to laparoscopy, unfortunately it didn't really happen as much as switching people from laparoscopy to robotics because this is just an easier way to do minimally invasive surgery. But we're all familiar with the ROLAR trial and we know that it unfortunately failed to show any benefit whatsoever to the use of the robot. Nice study, beautifully designed study by David Jane, Al uh, Alessio Pagazzi, Phil Quirk is the reference pathologist. You can see equivalent groups of patients, equivalent groups of CRM positivity, equivalent nodes, mesorectal plane, really no differences at all. So, yeah, you know, what I tell people is pick whichever minimally invasive approach you uh, like best because you're best at it. Whether that is laparoscopy, whether that is robotic, whether that is transanal total mesorectal excision, you pick what's best and that's what's going to be best for your patient. Don't compromise your technical capabilities to satisfy what somebody necessarily wants. Be honest with the patient and say, well, I don't do robotics or I don't do laparoscopy or I don't do TAT, I mean, whatever it is, but you have to offer your best if you're the surgeon. With that type of approach, they're all equivalent laparoscopy, robotic, and TAT are all equivalent, and all of them are better than open surgery. So any way you can come up with avoiding open surgery is best, at the very least conferring short-term benefits, pain, uh, and, and recovery from the surgery and discharge from hospital and all the rest of it, uh, and later on less adhesions and, and less wound infections and less hernias and the like. What if we can just avoid operating altogether? instead of um, having to um, uh, think about which type of surgery, whether laparoscopic or robotic or TAT in Europe, and what if we don't operate at all? And wait and watch, obviously, again, really 
got its beginnings um, by Angelita Habergama, then picked up by Rodrigo Perez, uh, and they've shown many, many times that uh, it works. Not at everyone, not all the time, but it works. And there are problems. Why should we even consider it? Surgery after chemo radiation is not necessarily benign. Patients get low anterior section syndrome. And most patients who have chemo radiation and then have a distal anastomosis have a diverting leukoleostomy. And that diverting leukoleostomy has problems, high output, uh, dehydration, the need for an intravenous. When the ileostomy is closed, there are potential complications at the time of closure, such as a fistula or leak in the closure or an abscess in the closure plus a second hospitalization for closure site at which the ileostomy used to be is subject to hernia formation. So if you can find that there's no residual tumor in the specimen, which you might find after standard therapy in 10 to 20% of patients, but you could find after uh, TNT regimens and others in far higher percent of patients, why not just watch? So in one of the many papers from uh, Professor Habagama and, and uh, Professor Perez, 71 patients had the complete clinical response. And by the way, wait and watch isn't when it's almost completely responded. It's applicable when it's applicable. And it's not always applicable, but it's potentially applicable when you look endoscopically and there's no lesion and you feel and there's no irregularity. Um, and very importantly, you've done an MRI and that shows no evidence of tumor. The idea of biopsy is, is debated, but most people would not biopsy if the MRI shows no residual disease and the digital exam and endoscopy show no residual disease. But the interesting point is that if there's a local regrowth, which is rare, it's generally salvageable. But beware, because a complete clinical response, which includes the MRI, does not always correlate with a pathologic complete response. And that may be the reason for uh, failure. So this was a study we had done years ago when Wait and Watch was first being discussed. Um, and we said, can we avoid radical surgery? So we looked at patients who had their rectums removed and found that in uh, two or 12% of the patients who had a complete clinical response and a complete imaging response, um, and even a complete pathologic response to the wall. So even by path assessment, Dr. Barrow said, no, there's no residual tumor. 12% of those patients had deposits in the mesorectum. And that's probably why patients recur, why we need better imaging methods and why we need to keep an eye on this particular uh, option for patients. Um, so, you know, if we can avoid surgery, that's great, but we can't always. Moving on to uh, a theme within rectal cancer, very near and dear to me. Those of you who know me know that uh, Dr. Barrow and I spent 10 years developing this national accreditation program for rectal cancer because we had many problems in the United States treating rectal cancer. Again, turning to our national, data, uh, national cancer database with 31,000 patients, we found that there was huge variations in the appropriate use of evidence-based new adjuvant therapy. We also found, unfortunately, that the uh, majority of patients, the vast majority, were treated in lower intermediate volume centers. And it's unfortunate because the greatest adherence to evidence-based guidelines was in high volume centers. So most patients are treated where they're less likely to have their care dictated by evidence-based guidelines. And some of that problem translated to how the surgery is being done. So we found what embarrassingly is the highest circumferential resection margin positivity rate in the world, 17%. Most other countries are under 10%. 17% positivity, again, to a degree volume dependent. And over the course of 2011 to 2016, we created the program. And then over the last several years, beta tested it uh, and then launched it. And we're now busy accrediting programs throughout the United States based upon uh, these uh, process measures, such as having a rectal cancer MDT, such as having a rectal cancer program director and, and a coordinator, 
uh, and providing education to all of the named members from the American College of Radiology, the College of American Pathologists, the American Society of Rectal Surgeons, uh, respectively, all of these things that are processes and then looking on for performance, like has the patient had a CEA level? Uh, has the patient undergone a rectal cancer protocol uh, MRI with the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the required use of a, <coughs> apologies, Hi, dust I'm in New York, more dust than in Florida, um, with the use of a synoptic report. Um, synoptic report is mandatory. So these become performance measures. So we have our process measures and then our performance measures. And initially, prior to COVID, we had about 16 centers out of 1,500, approximately 1,500 Commission on Cancer accredited centers in the US. Roughly 20 centers uh, were in process, 16 accredited. Um, we had one year with no accreditations because of COVID. And now we have about 60 more programs uh, waiting for accreditation. We're thrilled that at Cleveland Clinic Florida, we were the second program in the United States. The first one was in California at, at uh, John Muir Hospital in Walnut Creek. We were the second hospital accredited by the NAPRC and are actually coming up on our first reaccreditation survey. So working together in a multidisciplinary team it is key. This is a main focus for improving rectal cancer outcomes because it's not just what Dr. Rosato can do or Dr. Valito can do or I can do. And it's not how good Dr. Verho is. It's all of us together working with radiation oncology, medical oncology, radiology, pathology, and surgery together. And that's the nature of the MDT. So even in the absence of an accreditation process in Argentina, you certainly can adhere to those same standards, even though there's no external audit. And you can internally audit to be sure you're doing all of those things that improve outcomes. Moving on to some other advances, talk about anastomotic leaks, trying to improve outcomes. Anastomotic leaks are horrifically costly uh, in terms of morbidity, in terms of functional, oncologic, and financial sequelae. So it's great that we can give new adjuvant therapy, we can shrink down the tumor, we can do a coloanal, maybe an intersphincteric, maybe a TATME with a laparoscope, with a robot, we can do all these wonderful operations. But if the patient leaks, a lot of those wonderful things are negated by the patient having an abscess, needing drainage, being presented to morbidity mortality, having a stoma defun of defunctioning stoma for longer, and then later having suboptimal function, a higher chance of cancer occurrence, and a tremendous financial impact. And just to look at some of these factors uh, in this premier perspective database study, you can see propensity matching showed that the length of stay after a leak was about a week longer per patient than with than without a leak, more post-op infections, and more readmissions with anastomotic leaks. So the one advance that I think is worthwhile that we've recently seen is fluorescence imaging. And one of the pioneers, two of the pioneers are, are Argentinian, uh, Raul Rosenthal, who uh, started the International Society for, for Fluorescence Guided Surgery, and Fernando Dip, who works with us and uh, also works in Argentina. And, and Fernando has done a lot of the basic science, a lot of the research uh, working with uh, fluorescence imaging with endocyanine green. So this one study in which I had uh, participated was comparing um, uh, fluorescence imaging not to any control group, but just comparing it in terms of outcomes. There was no control arm. It's just criticism of the study. It's not a randomized controlled trial. It's not propensity matched. We just wanted to see how fluorescence imaging worked. And we had lots of typical endpoints for, for leaks, fever, bowel function, other complications. And just to show you how it works for those of you who don't use it, we've mobilized the colon, we've divided the blood supply, and we want to confirm that where we're going to transect is well vascularized. And indeed, as you can see, it is very, very well vascularized here just to stop a second and actually go back just a second and a little bit more. So you can see where we're putting our purse string clamp, there's a little bit more green going past it. So the anesthetist is given three and a half cc's of ICG uh, and a 10 cc flush and within 30 to 60 seconds using a near infrared wavelength, which most every laparoscopic camera has these days, regardless of who made the camera, 
uh, we can then see this bright green fluorescence in patients. So it's near infrared imaging. And we know that it's healthy past here. Now, most of the time you can tell by the naked eye, but not always. There can be a discrepancy. And when there's a discrepancy, it usually is the ICG wins out. That if you wait long enough and go back, the segment in question will look ischemic to the naked eye as well. But the ICG gives an early warning. So once the stapler is then closed, we can add more ICG, have the anesthetist give another three and a half, look inside and see the serosa. And then after the stapler is fired with a zero degree uh, camera and a, a custom designed rigid proctoscope, we can see the image. There's three images on the, on the screen, which are There's three images. The top is white light. So this is what you would typically see if you put in a proctoscope after the anastomosis was created. The middle one is called a spy image, which is a true angiogram, if you will. And then this one is the ICG with fluorescence. So you could do your air test while you're visualizing the anastomosis and while you're testing for vascularity with, with ICG. And what the trial showed us was that um, we changed surgical plan in 5.8% in in the low risk patients and 7.5% of, of cases in the high risk. What's high risk? You can read at the bottom of the slide. An anastomosis under 10 centimeters in a radiated pelvis or both under 10 centimeters and radiated. So it's either or. And conversely, the low risk anastomosis subgroup or anastomosis above 10 centimeters with no radiation. So you can see it led to a few anastomotic revisions. But usually the amount of change was small and that's, you know, that, that's subtle. So if it's a centimeter, you know, you may not catch that with the naked eye. That one centimeter can make all the difference of an anastomotic leak. It can be more, 14 centimeters. And this is a case where it looked perfectly pink, went on to do a bunch of other things during the operation and 10 minutes later, it didn't look pink. But the point is if we didn't have the ICG, we would have said, yep, it looks pink on the first go round and closed. And then the patient presumably would have had an anastomotic leak. But as you can see, usually it's not a big distance. The median is one and a half centimeters. And so you can see here's, you know, with a, a, a little change, here's where we're gonna transect here. Not me, it's not my video, but here would have been the transection, but it's really not ideal. So they're gonna to have to go back further in this case and clean off until this area when you're well within green. So this is where it was expected to be cleared. This is where it's actually gonna be cleared. So the margins change. Now you could do other things too. You can look for bleeding, you can look at the color uh, and the like, but this technique is very, very reproducible. So there you go. Now you pick an area that's well within the green and you're gonna transect at that area. There's a lot of, of ICG going past there, and that's very important. You don't want to go right to the very edge of what fluoresces. You'd like to have a little bit of a safety margin, uh, if possible, for your anastomosis. What did we find? That our anastomotic leak rate was 2%, which is way lower than in the literature where most series show anastomotic leak rates for high-risk anastomoses of 10 to 15%. And we've gone on in other trials to show other um, scenarios in which ICG can work. For example, this one where we looked at our uh, um, we looked at our TATME cases uh, and low anterior sections. And in this study, we looked at, at anterior sections only, fluorescence angiography, no fluorescence angiography, um, pretty similar groups, more colonic J pouches in this group, but no anastomotic leaks in these patients versus 6.7% in the other group. This was the TATME subset along with Antonio Lacey. And you can see that we changed plans in 22.7%. Now, why is it so high? In the literature for most series, the change is about six or 7%. Frederick Riss's study from Geneva and others, around 6%, 7%. Why is it so high? I think when you deliver the colon transanally, especially if you're going to fold it back on itself for a colonic J pouch, it gets constricted by the levator muscles and the anal sphincters. And I think because of that constriction, 
that it doesn't perfuse as well as when we bring it out through an abdominal wall incision through a retractor. And I think that is why the surgical plan changes more with transanal than with transabdominal uh, ex uh, extraction. Now, another area that I'd like to touch on, again, along the lines of, of improving continence, saving continence, improving quality of life, complex perianal fistulas, which are variably defined in these categories, high intersphincteric, a high transphincteric, suprasphincteric, extrasphincteric, or at least two external openings. And anytime we treat fistulas, we're trying to balance cure with continence. With what we do in colorectal surgery, any any, any disease for which there's a plethora of treatments is usually attestation to the fact that there is no one universal panacea treatment for that therapy. So think about rectal prolapse. How many options to treat prolapse? 50, 60, more? Think about anal fistulas. Very similar. You know, if you think about some other therapy, uh, a stricture, a, a terminal stricture in Crohn's disease that doesn't respond to medical management, you could do resection. You can do another colic resection. It's pretty straightforward. A splenic flexure cancer, you're going to resect it. Okay, you could argue about extended right, extended left, but there's not that many choices. When it comes to fistulas, look at all these things we could do to patients, which again tells me that nothing is perfect. So one of the problems that all of these therapies share is the potential to worsen the patient's continence by dividing muscle or by postoperatively the wound getting infected like after a flap and compromising continence. So looking at some of these treatments, fibrin glue, one of the treatments that started out with 74% you know, success, everyone's very excited. Um, you know, Buchanan in the UK found 14% success rate. So as time went on, this treatment certainly was not found to be any great shakes. Fistula plugs, another similar one, uh, described early on as having success rates of 80 to 100%. Um, we found 14% in our center with fistula plugs, very similar to what was found for fibrin glue. Lift procedures, that one has held up better, but we're starting to see some high failure rates, uh, success of only 40%, only 68%, certainly not hitting the uh, 85 to 92% even early on. Likewise for flaps, treating uh, fistulas with flaps. 86% uh, Mahir Abbas's study, um, down to 60% here with variable rates of recurrence. So another option is an advanced on flap, but again, it's not perfect. VAFT, something we don't have in the US, but uh, is in Europe, and I believe it's available in Latin America, the video-assisted fistula, again, seems to have a, a relatively high rate of healing, um, but it's all over the map, 52% to 88%. So what intrigued me a few years ago uh, when uh, Takeda Pharmaceutical came to me, they no longer exist, it's now... Uh, uh, sorry, it was a Tygetics. Sorry, Takeda exists, of course. Tygetics was acquired by Takeda. And the product was developed with Damian uh, Olmo Garcia in um, uh, Madrid. And it's a type of stem cell, a pluripotent cell that helps in wound healing and may help for fistula treatment. They're mesenchymal cells. They inhibit T cell function and proliferation and, and, and change regulation of, of T cells, um, but they're pretty well tolerated, perhaps because they don't have an HLA class two antigen uh, and, and they have immunologic privilege. So the, one of the earlier studies that was done um, showed that at 24 patients, 12 got stem cells, 12 placebo, and using the Cleveland Clinic and continence score, um, patients had no compromise in continence in either group. In fact, they had improvements in both group. Um, sorry, that just went back. They had improvements in both groups uh, for fecal incontinence, but as time went on, the improvement was much more robust in the myoblast groups. The placebo effect was early. But by the 12 month mark, whereas the stem cell group uh, improved dramatically, 15 in common score down to 6.5, uh, 
the placebo effect from the placebo group, if you will, wore off and their kind of scores back to baseline. So the therapy takes a while because, and that's not surprising, the stem cells are like a scaffold for ingrowth, allowing the muscle to hypertrophy, allowing more muscle cells to develop. Unlike most other treatments that when they're administered, they quickly get worse. This is the opposite. They're administered and they get better over time, unlike things like glue and plugs, but well tolerated. So for anal fistulas, Damien came up with the idea, here's a therapy that may actually help incontinence. So it's certainly not gonna help hurt patients with a fistula. So for fistula treatment, we do not inject the cells in the tract themselves. There's no muscle in the tract. You want to inject the cells around the tract so that the muscle grows in and collapses the tract. So what's being shown here in the cartoon is treating the fistula, basically just gently curetting the tract. And then after putting a stitch in the internal opening, and by the way, the patient has a seton for a couple of weeks. So the seton's removed. The tract is very gently curetted here. And then we inject around, not in, but around the tract in the muscle, because these are the areas where the muscle is going to be able to regenerate, to hypertrophy, uh, and to expand based upon those, those stem cells. Mm. And basically, once the stem cells are in, it's an outpatient procedure, you just kind of massage the area a little bit. Here's how it's done. So the interloping is injected, the other rest of the tract is injected. That's all very well proscribed. How does it work? Well, 212 patients with Crohn's disease with complex fistulas, as I defined to you earlier, pretty evenly matched between the stem cells and placebo, but big, big difference in terms of um, outcome. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here too in terms of immunomodulators and anti-TNF agents between the two groups that you can see. So when you say who's getting neither uh, the anti-TNFs nor the immunomodulators, you see that there is a difference uh, between the two groups of patients. But when you look at efficacy, there's also a big difference in favor of the stem cells. At every time point, you can see when you look at clinical remission here, how the stem cells outperform the control or the placebo group at every single time point. Others have looked into it too. This is another uh, trial. Uh, this one is not Crohn's disease out of Korea. This is standard de novo cryptoglandular fistula, um, but also a phase two clinical trial. Far fewer patients, 15 patients. So six and nine, nowhere near what Damian uh, Garcia Olmo did in, uh, in, um, in Madrid. But you can see complete closure and incomplete closure in, in the two groups here. So this is how it's followed down. And, and again, there was certainly benefit, as you can see here, uh, complete closure 69%. So pretty robust response, all things considered. You can try and combine treatments. And uh, Eric Dozwa, the <laughs> Mayo Clinic, looked at patients who had a fistula plug, as I showed earlier, you know, fistula plug, collagen plug, which was kind of dipped in, if you will, stem cells. So packed with stem cells, then put in the plug. So here's what that looks like, standard fistula plug, except it's also got stem cells with it. And the results were pretty reasonable. Radiographic improvement with, with MRI, 11 out of 15 patients, and, but four patients, no clinical improvement. There's a lot of other advances we've made to, to do what I mentioned early on in the talk in terms of prolonging life, uh, decreasing disease recurrence, improving quality of life, avoiding stomas, improving continence. I mean, again, th this lecture could become an entire semester long course. And these are just a few of the other things that we could chat about, but I've kept it deliberately to, to 45 minutes because I'd really like to leave the last 15 minutes for some question and answers. And we certainly could touch on some other topics. Um, I can only again reiterate my, my thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Rosato for inviting me tonight. And thanks everyone for sharing uh, this hour uh, with us. And, and also I'm grateful to, to live in an era when we've made so many advances in our specialty in our lifetimes that, that so many operations we do now didn't exist. Diagnostic modalities that didn't exist. 
um, methods of treatment that didn't exist, and, and even the fact that we care as much about outcomes now as we do compared to before. Not just outcomes like cancer, but quality of life and continence, things that were not looked at as assiduously uh, in prior decades. So again, thanks and, and happy to entertain questions. Thank you, Stephen, for this magnificent uh, presentation. You just covered almost the most uh, important topics. Uh, si alguien quiere hacer alguna pregunta, por favor, les pido que lo envíen por el chat. <clears throat> Yo solo querría hacerle una pregunta al doctor Wexner. La voy a hacer en inglés. Uh, if you have to pick just three of the most important innovations in the past 10 years up to 2021, which would those be? Quality of life, you said, I think it's not a collateral thing. Everything has, every paper in itself has a, a evaluation of quality of life, whatever you pick, it's history of treatment, cancer treatment, whatever. I think that's very important, something we didn't take into account years ago. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, if I had, had to pick like the top three, and again, one of them I didn't even go into, which is uh, circular staplers, because I, I think if, if we try and say, how do we save sphincters, it's a combination, and whether that's for ulcerative colitis or, or, or it's for rectal cancer, the ability to circular stapler allowed far more surgeons to operate in the pelvis and allowed everyone operating the pelvis to do lower anastomoses more comfortably and more reliably. So the first thing I would say is, is, is circular staplers. Um, and the second one I'd say is minimally invasive surgery. And it started with laparoscopy and, and now it's branched out in other areas, um, whether robotic or TATME. So, so number one, circular staplers. Um, number two would, would definitely be uh, minimally invasive surgery in, in my opinion. And number three, I think, is probably the fact that we're smart enough now to know that we can't do everything on our own. That's, that's, that's an advance in that pretty much everything we do should be multidisciplinary in nature. Now, for rectal cancer, I mentioned the groups involved, uh, medical oncology, radiation oncology, pathology, and, and imaging and surgery, plus, of course, genetics and pancreatic or biliary surgery, spine surgery, when necessary. But think about other areas too. Think about functional disorders. Both you and, and Lucio Oliveira, who is a, another one of our alumni I see on the call tonight, uh, recently were in the pelvic floor group for the American Society of Rectal Surgeons. And that group was with urogynecologists and urologists and radiologists. And so, you know, again, that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team approach is something we've learned in the last few decades that, you know, we, we, we can be humble and we can say to the patient, you know, here's what I think we're going to do, but we're going to sit down with a lot of experts who have different viewpoints and figure out how to best take care of you. Great. Uh, I would like Giovanni to put on his mic because I would like uh, his point of view. Something you didn't mention, and I know it's well known in Europe. Thank you, Giovanni. El doctor Giovanni Milito de Roma. Es medianoche pasada, ya así que gracias por acompañarnos. And uh, I, I, I would like to hear a word about, you have experience with something that has not been very popularized in, in uh, America and, uh, of course, in, in Argentina. What about the treatment of uh, fistula of the uh, digestive tract with the endosponge. Why do you think that has occurred and uh, which is your point of view, please, Giovanni? Uh, in uh, my experience um, in the uh, <clears throat> two, three years, uh, in case of low, uh, low leakage in the colorectal uh, cancer, we use the endosponge for two, three times just to clean the, um, the abscess. And then we try to approach from transcendental to close the, uh, the leakage. No weight that uh, weight, uh, the, the leakage will be completely closed, just uh, clean the abscess the cavity and then we approach from 
below just to close and to avoid sometimes the ileostomy or the colostomy. colostomy. This is uh, our policy in the last two years with very good results. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a very important one. And I wish we had it in the U.S. Unfortunately, it's not marketed or commercialized in the U.S. Um, I think there's uh, people do make their own using the, the foam and using a nasogastric tube. You can do it, but it's much harder. But again, it, just in the interest of time, I, I didn't go through all these other things that, that are out there. For example, sacral neuromodulation is something that we've introduced. You know, we, ha we had stimulated gracilloplasty. We don't now. We had artificial bowel sphincter, at magnetic anal sphincter. Um, we've got the, um, the other therapies that have been at the gatekeeper of Carlo Ratto, your technique that you've done, Billy, for, you know, incontinence. There, there are so many different, um, uh, Celesta, I mean, there's a host, I didn't even touch in those. Uh, there's the treatments of anal fissures that we haven't got into just, in, you know, because you can't cover everything in a 45 minute lecture, but, but the in, anal fissures that used to be when you and I were residents, the sphincterotomy was pretty much the only treatment. Now you've got um, uh, uh, nifedipine, nitric oxide, diltiazem, maybe botulinum toxin, right? You've got other methods of, of treating anal fissures, even hemorrhoids, that there's, you know, the, the uh, procedure for prolapse and hemorrhoids is out there, as well as some of the other treatments like the hemorrhoid artery ligation. So there's, you know, it's, it's just tremendous amounts of growth in every direction. I just picked a few that I thought were interesting. Can I, can I ask a question, Stephen? How is it possible a difference of 14 centimeter in a slide that you presented. There is a difference of 14 centimeters in the, after the uh, injection, uh, the distance of the margin where you are going to resect. How is it possible? 14 centimeters. This is, is a very long chart. Yeah, I, I've seen this happen since the trial on two or three occasions. Um, one was operating live with Antonio Lacy in, I think was Thailand, um, uh, or could have been Israel, one or the other. And a couple of other occasions where it looks really pink, it looks healthy. And the ICG doesn't perfuse it. And you say, it's really strange because you look and the marginal artery is preserved. Everything looks okay but you go do something else for 10 minutes and come back and then you see it is ischemic. It's what I call the early warning system. For some reason in some patients, the colon perfuses. And I don't have an explanation and I don't see it often, but it's pretty sobering when you do see it, that that area that looks pink, 10 minutes later, doesn't look pink. And without the ICG, we wouldn't have still been there 10 minutes later. We would have said, okay, there's the anastomosis. Now we just make the leukoleostomy and leave. So it, it, I just think it's more sensitive than the naked eye. You would have seen it. that 14 centimeters would have showed up if you hung around another 10 minutes. I see. And you give the all the time an endoscopic approach at the end of the anastomosis. Do you give an endoscopy? Yeah, I do four things with every uh, left-sided or low anastomosis. Number one, look at the donuts. Number two, air leak. Number three, look at the anastomosis endoscopically. And number four, use ICG. And if it's a hand-sewn coloanal, there's no donut, then we still do the others. We still do the air leak, although it's a reverse air leak. The patient is in the head up position. And we've published this last year. The patient's in the head up position. And you can, with an anoscope, look down below between the sutures. And if there's fluid, you can put a stitch. So it's a reverse air leak test. Still doing ICG uh, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Giovanni. I'm really glad you're here tonight. Stephen, we don't want to cut you up because uh, I know you have uh, a dinner. Uh, this is your fourth Zoom on the day. So you, you by That's sure, okay. you're there's tired. No you got five minutes. I'm happy to answer up to you. Okay. Alguno tiene alguna pregunta que quiera enviar por uh, there's a couple of uh, congratulations for your talk. Lucia, yes. Hi. Very nice talk, Steve. Okay. I just would like to ask you if you are routinely using the 
Pelican Group questionnaire to stratify patients who could have a chance of Lars syndrome before of, uh, offering the procedure. Are you, are you using this? Before, before offering which procedure you cut out? I mean, if you, if you have a patient with a rectal cancer okay. and you will choose in the yeah. MDC, uh, the best treatment for the specific. No, no. Martín, Okay. Anyway, uh, if you are uh, selecting the best treatment for the, the specific patient. Mm -hmm. um, are you using any kind of questionnaires to select, to, to, to see if this patient has a chance of large syndrome? And then maybe you change your, um, you know, your specific treatment modality that you choose in the MDT. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is no. And the reason is, if you tell a patient you have a high chance of LARS, so your alternative is a colostomy, most patients are going to say, I'd rather take the risk and see if I get LARS or not. Um, and so the only thing we do look at, which we will say, no, we know you're going to have a problem, is an incontinence score. So if somebody has a baseline of significant fecal incontinence, and they're going to require a distal coloanal, we try and tell them not to do that, that they're just going to be miserable. But I, I don't want to predict somebody's going to do poorly because maybe they won't. Thank you, Stephen. There is a question from uh, Dr. Pablo Singolani. I know you already went over that topic, but maybe he just uh, entered a little bit late. So uh, he, he would like you uh, to comment about which are the advantages of performing robotic surgery on rectal cancer uh, as comparable with, uh, with laparoscopy or even, or of course not open surgery, but comparing laparoscopy and robotic surgery for low cancers, rectal cancers. Yeah, well, to this day, there remain no proven advantages to the robot over laparoscopy. What is different is that more people are more comfortable using a robot than a laparoscope in the deep pelvis and find it easier to sit down. I'm not one of them, but I understand that most people prefer, it's an easier learning curve and they prefer to use the robot. The oncologic outcomes are no different. The short-term outcomes are no different. But what I think the robot does afford is more people to offer minimally invasive surgery in the deep pelvis than would be done with the laparoscope because it's just too technically challenging for most people. Unless you're doing five or 10 major cases every single week, you're not going to be able to master the learning curve laparoscopically. And so I think using the robot is a very valid option to help those patients. Um, but I don't think it should be used because you think it's better. I just think you should use it because that's the way you like to do it. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can just uh, end the session. In uh, nombre del Hospital Universitario Austral y el mío hay una última de Patrono Uriburu from the British Hospital. Uh, uh, ah, he, he wants to have uh, your point of view about uh, the adoption of uh, intelligence uh, artificial intelligence in the US in the next coming years? Oh, there's no doubt artificial intelligence is gonna play a bigger role. And that may be along the lines of what like Dr. Olivero was just talking about where, you know, maybe you're gonna put all these parameters in an algorithm and tell the patient, you have a risk of incontinence of 90% and the patient might say, I don't want that risk. That's exactly the kind of thing. And it might be based on a lot more parameters than we can calculate on our own. Within surgery, artificial intelligence will be used to put overlays of, let's say, an MRI plus fluorescence imaging 
or be able to differentiate things like nerves in, in the pelvis and an obese patient, the arrogant nerves, you know, because I didn't even go into it, but fluorescence imaging has many more uses that Fernando Dip has been working on, ureters, nerves, lymph nodes, but they all look the same color, so AI has to help you differentiate. So I think it's gonna be used both uh, preoperatively as well as intraoperatively. Okay, Stephen. This was great. I enjoyed, I, I think everybody has enjoyed your talk. Uh, enjoy your dinner. Say hello to Mariana and your kids, uh, uh, Wesley and Traver, and uh, have a nice day in New York. Hope your mom gets a little bit better. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. Bye, Giovanni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y disponer del tiempo y nos estaremos viendo seguramente pronto. Adiós. Hasta luego. Chao. 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 Chao a todos. Chao. Chao. chao.